Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I see that many of you have strategically placed yourselves by the air conditioning units. Good for you, that's adaptation and resilience. Today's session with some amazing speakers is about access to clean energy. And we'll be looking at different themes of access to clean energy, and each of our speakers has a slightly different perspective, but you'll see themes emerging from the conversation of through the chain of the source of the energy, thinking about uh, power to cool, thinking about access, thinking about finance. And so let us um, get right into the conversation. Our esteemed panelists are Lavinia Baroche, the global head of ESG at Deutsche Bank. Welcome, Lavinia. Joseph Curtin, Managing Director of Power and Climate at the Rockefeller Foundation. And Tracy Lane, Director of Climate, Renewable Energy and Resilience, KPMG East Africa. Thank you all for joining us today. And uh, thanks to my colleague, Jorge Castellamendi, for putting the session together so expertly. Thank you very much. And so let us turn the mic over to Lavinia for some opening comments to help frame the issues, and then we'll get into a, a, a dialogue. Over to you, Lavinia. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us today, and also, my warmest thank you to the organizers of today. Thank you to the Resilient Hub, to the Atlantic Council, the Adrian Esch Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center for bringing us all together here today for this very, very important discussion. The energy access inequalities are a central barrier to a just transition. The self-inflicted triple planetary crisis that humanity is facing is at times overwhelming. We need to tackle climate change, we need to tackle pollution, and we need to tackle biodiversity at the same time. These are all interconnected, and we need to tackle them in their entirety, urgently, through a just transition. Decarbonization is a key part of transition, and we need to accelerate our efforts to successfully decarbonize further. This plays a key role in our transition dialogue with our clients today. But while we start to feel more comfortable with the concepts of transition finance, we now need to advance our understanding and the pathways for adaptation finance. Access to affordable and clean energy is a crucial mitigating factor in tackling the triple planetary crisis and to ensure a just transition. In 2020, only 733 million, oh, no, sorry, still 733 million people didn't have access to electricity coming down from 1.2 billion back in 2010. So we made progress, but actually the, the electrification has um, slowed down tremendously. So we urgently need to increase these efforts. At the same time, we need to ensure that access to energy is resilient. Climate change induced weather extremes like floods and heat must be factored in. Without a resilient infrastructure, our efforts will be short-lived. Deutsche Bank is committed to a long-term partnerships in emerging markets and developing economies, in particular Africa, to deliver funding for sustainable finance needs we have deployed over 16 billion of our own balance sheet, as well as the balance sheet of our, of our institutional investors, um, from, to support African infrastructure development alone. We have arranged large-scale renewable energy projects throughout the continent and have partnered with the Clean Climate Fund to finance renewable electricity access for African households and small and medium-sized enterprises under the Universal Green Energy Access Program. But also in our work with GFANS, where we form uh, and support the work stream to mobilize finance to emerging markets, we are playing a role and we, we 
work alongside our partners to mobilize private capital that is necessary to national development strategies. Emerging and developing markets are facing substantial challenges at the moment in current environment, including climate change and adaptation costs. But despite all these challenges, Africa has the potential to become a green superpower. A more sustainable future needs investment. And we at Deutsche Bank, we have committed to support with, Euro, with 500 billion euros until 2025, the overall sustainable finance uh, money which is needed. And we support our clients in supporting their pathways to net zero. Partnering is a common theme in what I've just mentioned, and I truly believe that partnerships are creating impact. To create impact, our organizations and all stakeholders need to collaboratively work together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lavinia. That's a good framing for the conversation. And as I said, our panelists come at this issue uh, from a different perspective. And as we think about oftentimes our mitigation colleagues in one house and our adaptation and resilience colleagues in another house, uh, the solutions we know are uh, in the middle and that we have to think about both and that resilience is uh, a result of having the power that we need for electricity, for kids to learn and have lights to be able to go to school, water and cooking and all of the things that are the basic human rights. And so um, let me start with Tracy and ask, what are the important challenges and lessons that you've learned through your work with KPMG in East Africa? Uh, thank you. Thank you for that question. So um, I'm based in, in Kenya, in East Africa, working for KPMG, where I lead our climate change and renewable energy work. Now, from our perspective, and we've worked a lot in um, the energy access field, along with resilience building activities through our development partner um, work in the region. So energy access is not separate from resilience. Energy access builds resilience. It allows our children to um, further their education. It allows our women and families to increase their productivity and to gain efficiencies in their households um, and free up time for income generating activities. And it increases productivity of small businesses all across Africa. Now, n right now, nearly half of Africa's population does not have access to electricity. And that's a lot of people. <laughs> that's nearly, nearly 600 people without access to electricity. So all of those people, they cannot turn on a light at the end of the day. They can't flip on the fan when it's hot like we can. Um, so it, it's, it's a real challenge. They also can't refrigerate their food or their medicines in emergencies, for example, and in, in their health centers. Now, when we think about energy access, I think there's a tendency to often think about um, grid extension and public utilities and, and very large-scale investments to get that done. And that, that is important and that's needed, but that's not the only, the only solution. We don't have time to wait for that to happen, and there's not enough public money to, um, to make that happen anytime soon. So there's really a, a critical role for the private sector to play in energy access, especially on distributed renewable energy, including solar home systems, for example. Um, but what we've seen is that the private sector, especially in places across Africa, really needs support. It needs support to get into this space and to be able to do more. So it needs an enabling environments, it needs taxation, friendly taxation policies, um, uh, business regulation policies, et cetera, but it also needs finance. In the West, we have... Um, pretty well-developed systems for supporting businesses with new ideas to come into a, a new sector or a new market. But that doesn't really exist at scale in Africa. So there's a real challenge to identify new ideas that the private sector might have to come into the renewable energy space and other resilience building sectors 
Um, they need support, they need funding. We're talking here at COP about climate finance, mobilizing climate finance at scale, and that's one side of the challenge. The other side is channeling that finance down to where it needs to be. That includes not just civil society organizations, which is critical, but also the private sector, because they have kind of an inherent willingness or a built-in desire to really grow and sustain and provide the service that, that they've been set up for and continue running that over time. Um, so I think, I think bringing together those two issues, uh, the, the local solutions that are needed to, to, to tap into the local solutions to deal with local challenges, entrepreneurs with ideas, local entrepreneurs who can um, kind of take their ideas and apply them to the context that they're in and the challenges that they're having, and then um, supporting them with funding um, and the other sort of broader ecosystem of support. That's a really important challenge and we've been able to kind of work in that space and we can talk about that a little bit more as we go on. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and nice to be here. I just would like to start by saying how relieved I am because when we were preparing for this session, Kathy threatened that we would have to do an icebreaker, that we would either have to sing a song or do a little dance. <laughs> or a show and tell so i've been petrified about that all morning so i'm so happy that all i have to do is speak and talk to you about the work that we do at the rockefeller foundation and um, that seems a lot easier um but anyway so as as kathy said i work at the rockefeller foundation and our our mission in the foundation is to make opportunity universal and sustainable and so climate change even since i joined the foundation has become more and more central to everything that we do because we've realized we can't achieve our mission without addressing the climate crisis. And in a three degree world, the work we're doing in hunger, the work we're doing in food, the work we're doing in health, the work we're doing in sustainability, none of it, none of it matters in a three degree world. All those gains that we've made over the previous decades, to the extent that we've made gains will be reversed. And so as a sort of a, a climate nerd, it's been really encouraging for me and my time at the foundation to see climate change become central and become integrated into all of our programs. But I work in the Parent Parent Climate Team, and the DNA of the Parent Climate Team when I joined was this work on energy access that we're doing, which is uh, has been so inspiring to me, even though I haven't come from that kind of background. And the work really had its background in uh, India, where we we begun about a decade ago building mini grids, and these are small are medium-sized PV systems with battery storage that can provide energy access, clean energy access to communities, communities that either had unreliable access to electricity or indeed no access to electricity. Um, and seeing the impact that had, as Kathy mentioned, you know, for young girls doing their homework at night, you know, the, the safety provided by street lighting, the productive uses in the community, the access to micro enterprises, you know, ice making machines for drink stands or small, you know, hairdressers or printers, uh, and, you know, charging your phone and being able to have, I mean, that access that we all just take for granted, right, to the information economy and that sort of sense of connectedness to the modern energy economy. And so I've been myself on a journey and learning more about that work. Um, but the other strand that has become more important in the foundation is a focus on energy transition more um, acutely. And, and that's really the background that I've come from. I've always worked on emissions mitigation and energy transition. And so I've tried to bring a sort of a, a particular focus on coal to clean in our work because, you know, SDG 7 is not just about access to electricity. It's about access to clean, reliable electricity. and especially when um, our work in large emerging economies has become to increasingly focus on the challenge posed by burning coal for a safe climate future. And, you know, I've come to the very clear conviction that the one thing we have to do this decade if we're to have any chance of avoiding catastrophic climate change and three degrees warming is find solutions that can meet the development needs of growing countries that are not dependent on coal. And in fact, you know, that involves obviously stopping the thousand coal plants that are being built around the world, unfortunately, at the moment, and not just stopping them, but replacing that electricity with clean and reliable power. And then, um, you know, finding a solution to the you know, other 6,000 coal plants that are being built, that are already in existence around the world and are going to be pumping out uh, greenhouse gas, and gas emissions for the next uh, 30 or 40 years. And so 
we have a very prominent focus on that as well. And these two streams, the energy access stream and the mid transition stream, came together in a big initiative that we launched with the Bezos Earth Fund and IKEA Foundation at the last COP. And so it's the one year birthday of the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet. And I'm not going to try and sing happy birthday, Kathy, I'm sorry. And I'm not going to invite our audience to sing happy birthday. But, you know, this is a. I, I really think for a one-year-old organization, the Global Energy Alliance is, is doing wonderful work. It's working with 12 countries. I, I would say describe it as insider track work, where it works with governments, with decision makers, with energy utilities on systemic energy change and supporting, it's a kind of an inside-out approach, supporting the um, goals and ambitions of uh, those countries, countries like South Africa, Indonesia, Nigeria, um, who have incredibly ambitious goals for energy transition and energy access. And so really just supporting and enabling those goals and working at a systemic level, everything from working with governments to support implementation, to working with energy utilities, to working on project development on the ground. And so again, very inspired by that work. And then lastly, Kathy, I will stop now in a moment, but I wanted to tie in the resilience and work that we do and you know of course with Kathy you know resilience has been long been a, fo a foundation um, a focus of the foundation and we've been incredibly inspired to see the work that Kathy has been doing you know in the resilience center and working on heat and part of the thinking behind bringing us together here was to try and investigate those overlaps between resilience and power because we've seen this year already the incredible stress that the power sector power sectors around the world from, you know, Pakistan to Puerto Rico to Texas to California. Um, the duress that power systems are put under by climate extremes, particularly extreme heat, but also flooding events, also extreme cool, you know, um, cold snaps in Texas, for example. And so that's one angle. But then the other resilience angle is, is what you mentioned about the incredible resilience that is is brought to communities by clean energy access and particularly distributed clean energy access because distributed systems are much more resilient to heat extremes and you know we know that after um which hurricane i mean it take in in puerto rico the first hurricane not the most recent one um, and maria. maria um you know it took it took the puerto rican authorities you know months to get the power system back on board and so you know, building resilience into our power systems planning and um, really taking an intentional, intentional approach to resilience of our power systems is something that we, I think, really need to think about. And we don't have the answers. The International Energy Agency has said that, you know, only a very few power systems planners are really integrating resilience into their power systems planning. And then, of course, the, the last issue is the connection between heat and cooling. I think I said the last issue a few times, but this, I promise, is the last issue. Um, you know, is the connection between resilience and uh, between heat and cooling. And so, right now, a thousand or about a, a billion tons of carbon emissions are associated with cooling services alone. But a billion people have no access to cooling and are considered by SE for All to be in, um, highly vulnerable to heat events as a result of their lack of access to cooling. And so we need to find ways to bring those cooling services to a billion people without exacerbating the climate crisis. And so all of these things are connected, like you started off saying, Kathy. And you know, we all work in silos. And I think it's just really hard for us to think about how do we bring these issues together. And you know, we're we're sort of starting to think through that as a foundation, and starting to think through that as a as a team. And so hoping hoping to pick up some lessons from the audience and from my panelists as uh, fellow panelists as we bring that work forward. Thank you very much. Now that you've reminded me about this special feature about the dancing and the singing, thank you for reminding me. I, I had forgotten that. So I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll cook up something fun and special. Yeah, but, but for the time being, Lavinia, <laughs> I'd like to come to you and there's something, there's so many issues in here and you know, for a, a, a 55 minute panel, to uh, distill down to something that the audience can take away of what do we do differently? What do we do to advance this and accelerate this? And I think this issue of financing, these challenging environments, and you talked about the enabling environment, Tracy. Lavinia, could you talk about that a little bit? I mean, financing is essential. Um, and in the conversations that we have about, and we launched, uh, two days ago, the cool capital stack. And when you talk to investors, um, investors are looking for vanilla. You know, they're not looking for Neapolitan. Do you know, ice cream fans, do you know what I mean? 
And so um, these aren't these aren't vanilla projects. These are projects with multiple benefits and stakeholders and project uh, preparation needs. And so could you just talk a little bit about the the challenge of we love to talk about scaling and acceleration and I'm like mm, let's talk about that, <laughs> Lavinia. Yeah, happy to do that. And I would love to maybe reflect a little bit more on the one of the points I was trying to make initially. Um, over the course of the last years, the financial industry really has spent time to reflect and develop their understanding of transition finance. There's still much more to do, but we all have a better understanding now what it entails. And that's very much focused at the moment on indeed decarbonization of industrial processes, of ramping up access to renewable power in large scale, of understanding how corporate clients are transitioning, how countries are planning to transitioning. So in our conversation, we really have a strategic dialogue with clients to understand on which trajectory they are planning to cut down their, their carbon effects. This having said, that's a very different dialogue to look, uh, when, when to look into adaptation um, necessities, which are sometimes less predictable or many times less predictable. Um, we need a different, we have a different risk profile. We have smaller projects which are therefore uh, closely, more closely monitored, more closely managed. They have, to be, uh, they have to have a local access and a local team looking after it. So we are looking after a different effort also for managing such a portfolio and for a different risk profile. So the industry needs to develop different risks than we are talking for the rest of sustainable finance in that regard. We do have, of course, some examples and we have learnings, but there are still much more needed to really scale these efforts up. And it requires the whole industry together in collaboration with governments, with development banks, with the private sector capital, to really find ways of how to structure and, and provide access to these, finance, uh, to these finance angles. But at the moment, when we talk to corporates, these are dialogues where we, for example, talk to utilities on a national scale, where we talk about large-scale solar or, or wind farms, um, that's all in the making and it will be scaled up. But the last mile provide access to energy for the last, for the last meter, for the last mile of this grid is a different, a different challenge to tackle. Yeah, sure. I, um, your point on uh, investors are, are looking for vanilla, vanilla solutions. <laughs> They're not looking for crazy ice cream flavors. Um, and and the, the solutions that we need for ener energy access several years back when solar home systems were kind of um, uh, developing in the market. So solar home systems with a, a, a solar panel, a battery pack, a couple of lights, maybe a radio. These are pretty small systems. That's not a really a vanilla solution when you're talking about an investor from a bank in, in the developed world. It's something different, something they don't understand. So you do need to bring in someone who's going to be one who can come up with those solutions locally because they know the problems and they know what would work in their environment locally to address those challenges. Um, but also then you need someone willing to give them funding to, to, to try that out. Um, but small businesses, um, you can't get started without money. You can't do much without money anyway. So you need to have initial grant funding to let these um, entrepreneurs test their ideas, build their business model, and then scale up over time. So one thing that uh, KPMG has been doing for, for many years is working with development partners and donors to uh, take their, their available funds that they're interested to support resilience building activities, energy access, or other initiatives, um, pooling that together and working through um, kind of a fund, a challenge fund, you surface ideas from wherever they may be. We don't pick the ideas from out of the blue. You, you uh, issue a call for proposals, you reach out to the communities, you surface the ideas, you review them, identify what might work through a, you know, a panel of people who have different perspectives on what might work for different, uh, different problems, and then you support those with funding, 
with um, a full ecosystem of support around business development, uh, preparing financial plans, making investor pitches, marketing, etc. And you really support them throughout their whole journey as a business. First with that funding and the, and the support, then you help take them through um, to more commercial funding once they um, are ready to scale up. And then, then the, the idea, the model has been tested and proven a little bit, and those more commercial funders are more willing to step in and then take things further along from there. So back to the rainbow flavor then after that, yeah. So I wanted to dig in on the resilience part of this and the idea of the distributed energy. And Joe, you mentioned the, the mini grids and the, there are many benefits, but I, could you just explore, just go down one layer in specificity about that? I think it's really important and it's in lots of places, there are forces working against that. And so um, just maybe the challenges, but also the opportunities, thank you. Thank you, Cathy, for not asking me about finance. Um, I'm much, much appreciated. Um, yeah, the, the mini grid model, is, I mean, the role of philanthropy really is to, to take on the risks, the kind of risks that we've mentioned. And so we don't, we don't need necessarily a return on our capital. And so we can develop different business models and trial different um, approaches and opportunities. And so the mini grid has been something that we've backed for the last decade, and we've built somewhere in the region of four or 500 mini grids in India, for example, and at that point entered a partnership with Tata Power to build 10,000 mini grids in India by the end of the decade. So that's an example of the, the role that philanthropy can play. The challenge associated with the mini grid model is quite simple. It's, it's still quite an expensive way to generate electricity. It's hard to compete with, you know, it's, it's, the cheap, it's cheaper than diesel, so it's the cheapest off-grid way of generating electricity, but it's, it's still expensive electricity, and it's too expensive to power productive lives and livelihoods. If you know, you're talking 40, 50 cent a kilowatt hour, that's a lot more than people in you know, most Western countries pay for their electricity. And so we're doing a huge focus of GAP, this Global Energy Alliance that I mentioned, is to, you know, really try and scale the model to drive down costs and, you know, scale brings um, a reduction in cost. And so one of the things, for example, that GAP is doing is exploring pooled public, public procurement so that they can bring two, three countries together and uh, source some of the elements um, that can then be distributed to different countries, different suppliers. Um, and the initial experiments with pool procurement have been extremely successful. Um, the component costs themselves in Africa cost so much more than they would cost the inverters, the panels, the batteries, all costs more in Africa. The finance costs so much more in most African countries than it costs in you know, Western countries. So everything is stacked against providing this clean, reliable power to where it's needed most. And so for that reason, there is a huge onus on philanthropy to find solutions. The other thing that I would say that we're experimenting with and that we're exploring, which I think could be a game changer, is using carbon credits um, to really you know, change the calculus and change the business model. And so our uh, Smart Power India, which is you know, GAP's initiative in India is, al is already generating carbon credits from some of its mini grids. And carbon credits can actually reduce the cost of electricity to the end user by somewhere in the region of 8 to 10%. So it can really be a bit of a game changer. Um, and the problem is that for these small scale transactions, it do it, there's a huge onus on the project developer to go through all of the extremely onerous paperwork that's required to generate carbon credits. But, you know, I want to make one appeal in terms of carbon credits. You know, they have a very bad reputation, but if carbon credits can really, carbon markets can really be used to bring resources from rich corporations, rich countries to where they're needed, needed most, I, I think it's a little bit, you know, um, I find it a little bit annoying, to be honest, that we have NGOs and others saying to us, like, we shouldn't be using carbon credits. You know, if you go to, you know, a community that has a mini grid and you look at the benefits that's bringing and then you look at the sort of extra additional benef benefits that carbon credits can bring to that kind of project, I think we need to have an open mind and we need to, you know, not, not be, let the, you know, not be too purist about some of these things, uh, you know, not sort of 
cast all offsets as equally, um, you know, uh, illegitimate. And so, you know, I think that's another thing that we're doing, trying to develop that market, and we're working with a number of actors uh, to do that. So one of the aspects of that, I would just want to point you to an op-ed that Joe wrote in the New York Times, which for lots of people, that's a, um, that's a career milestone, so congratulations. But it, it explains and, and breaks down a little bit about what Joe is talking about in terms of um, those credits. And it, it is, they say, the definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. And so I think whatever we're doing isn't working. And what got us here is certainly not going to get us there. So um, I'm, I'm voting with you on that. Um, so I wanted to, you know, we at Arstrock, we really care about helping people and investing in communities um, to protect from heat. And I think the number is 1.3 billion people are going to be exposed to lethal heat waves. So 1,100 people died in two days in British Columbia and in um, the Pacific Northwest of the US, not this past summer, but the summer before. So it's a mass casualty event in a very wealthy nation. 15,000 people dead in Europe this summer. Um, I think the number of deaths in um, India, in the India and Pakistan heat wave of the summer, those numbers are rising. And so the role of renewable distributed power with all of the elements that the panelists have touched on all of this great work, and yet heat continues to rise. And so it, it's a pressure cooker on the good work that you're doing. And so bringing the solution of the power to do the cooling, um, there's, there are lots more elements, but uh, I think it's 1.7 billion air conditioners will be needed in the next, I think maybe even 10 years. I mean, we are going to need air conditioning. We can't passively cool ourselves um, to health. And so I just want to point that out, that when we talk about, you know, there are the benefits and then there are the threats that we're working against. And so the sooner, I mean, that cycle that we're all here talking about of, of emissions and heat waste that make it hotter, we need cooling. And the Clean Cooling Collaborative, who um, is, is one of our partners in the Cool Coalition, and there, there's a great effort underway, the Kigali um, it's now the Clean Cooling Collaborative at Climate Works, and so there's a lot of work on the clean and efficient air conditioning technologies, and there are other cooling technologies too, the cold chain, and we have a, a partnership with Mayor Yvonne Aki Sawyer and are building shade cover in the hot markets where the women um, traders are spending most of their day in the sun, and so we've got distributed solar that's providing lights and can provide cooling for refrigeration that extends the life of their products, brings more income. And so um, there are lots of really positive examples. Uh, the question that I have for you all, and then we're gonna take some questions from the audience, so prepare yourselves for insightful questions or any dance moves that anybody wants to display. You know, at the COP sometimes you need a little refresher, singing, dancing, poetry, whatever works for you all. Um, that we might talk about the elements of biodiversity and nature. And we've got this parallel crisis, but yet they're not separate. They go together. And how does that come to play? I'll go to Tracy for this one. Um, health and biodiversity, I mean, they're, they're in this big range of, of social and economic impacts. But just talk about nature for a little bit, if you don't mind. Sure. So I think um, when we, we, we've been talking about energy access and the, the need for cooling as the, as the globe heats. And I think we need to maybe also bring into play sort of the broader elements of resilience um, into this discussion. So it will be more than just um, air conditioning units in, in homes. Um, there will be other elements of resilience building that will be needed to help uh, support communities as this, as this happens to all of us. Um, and that will include things like um, uh, more um, sort of financial, financial stability, um, additional, the <laughs> sorry, I've lost my train of thought there. <laughs> I think the, um, the healthcare and the, 
and the cooling systems um, and the resilience that will be built all together. I think we need to come back again to some of the same tools that will be used to both enhance resilience through um, better health, uh, nature-based sol solutions that will enhance resilience, and the full circle that all comes together around all of that, and the linkages between them. It, they're not in isolation. So enhanced uh, nature-based solutions will um, allow communities more livelihood opportunities. It will also enhance cooling through shading. It will support their, um, their farms, for example. Then you bring into play the carbon credits, which would often be coming from nature-based solutions. So all of the linkages together are, are really important and to support, a supporting one is going to support them all because it's a cycle and they're all linked. But I think also targeting solutions at each, at each piece of that. So as we are facing this crisis of heat, um, it's not just can we um, support more energy access. That's one piece of a very big puzzle. We need to support all of the other sort of resilience building measures that are going to be needed um, as we face this crisis. I don't want to completely duplicate. I fully agree with you. <laughs> um, in particular, the, the local nature-based solutions will, will definitely be in focus and will be needed. And um, with, with carbon market developments, also from a sovereign level, that will be interesting to watch out. Um, but I would love to touch on a different point because you mentioned biodiversity. I think um, thoughts need to continue how to integrate biodiversity as capital also in the GDP calculations, also in the reporting of, of companies. Um, we saw first drafts, but there will be work, more work needed because at the moment we, we need to put a value on the value of nature. And uh, so that's, that's something which will change the picture overall and will also open up new, new opportunities to find solutions and to, to uh, drive that process. I didn't think so. Um, so what I want to do, we have um, we've just got, let's do a, like a, a lightning round. Here's the question. What's the one thing that you would change? What's a structural barrier that is in your way for your objectives, for your work, that you would change? And we, we have touched on it already, but just the one thing that's the, uh, I mean, there's so many, but the priority thing that you would change. And then we'll go to the audience questions. Joe. Well, I must plug our own work. It's slightly off topic in terms of this discussion, but you know, I think that we're losing the battle against coal so badly, and it's the one thing that we have to do this year or this decade to keep you know the, any hope of two degrees warming alive. And if we don't do, if we don't make a major reduction in coal use, probably 50 percent by 2030, there is no two degree world, and so. There's a couple of things happening. There's one sort of, there's a political innovation, if you like, these jet P conversations, but you know, the, the um, sorry, just energy transition partnerships. These are deals between the G7 and specific countries to kickstart energy transition in those countries. And the most obvious one is South Africa, which was signed at COP26 and is now moving forward. Not very optimistic about the direction those are, are trending. Um, and so the one thing, again, extremely controversial, the one thing I think that could provide the hundreds of billions, uh, at least 100, 150 billion of grant-like capital to accelerate the transition from coal is actually, the, is actually carbon markets, voluntary carbon markets and compliance um, carbon markets, but we need to develop a new type of carbon credit, which is, you know, a carbon credit that would support the accelerated transition from coal. If you close one coal plant 20 years early, let's say, you're going to save about, for an average coal plant, you're going to save about 20 or 30 million tons. Ireland, where I'm from, polluted, you know, 60 million tons last year. So one coal plant closed early can save 30 million tons. It's a, it's a lot of carbon. It has the potential to create a lot of carbon credits. And if you can sell those credits to someone, as I said, either, either corporates or countries, you know, I think that could be a massive game changer. And that carbon revenue can be used to leverage and de-risk private capital and really suck capital into the sector. So that's one kind of structural thing that we're working on um, with a couple of others. And maybe we'll be ready to announce something um, at COP28. In my mind, or in my view, we need an alignment of global standards. And we need to have a reduction of red tape. 
So bureaucracy, uh, bureaucracy is just, things take too long for solutions. Yeah, so um, Joseph was talking about scale on the mobilizing finance side of the, of the equation, and I would then translate that into also scale in the channeling finance to where it's needed side of the equation. You can't do one without the other. You won't have the impact that's needed. Um, and so I think putting those two together, making sure we bridge those activities with the activities to really um, take that funding and put it where it's needed, down at the very, very local level, on the front lines of the resilience challenges, on energy access, ch energy access challenges, it needs to be linked. And so I think you know, making sure those two sides of the equation are balanced. Thank you. One of the things that comes to mind in all that you three said is that the financial system that we currently have and the quarterly earnings reports and the expectation of return um, and what we're talking about and what it takes to get these things done don't match right now. So we'll do another session on that, but I just want to highlight <laughs> there's a barrier. It's a big one, and it keeps showing up. And, um, interesting ways. I mean, they're breakthroughs, I know, but let me turn to the audience for questions. Who has a question for one of our panelists? I think we just have one mic. So you want to say it and I'll repeat it? Maybe you don't have to get up. And for the online audience, the question is about fragile settings and the risk of uh, investing in renewable energy settings uh, systems and how um, successful, how prevalent those types of systems are now. It's just a fantastic question. Um, and the, the fact is that even our work, even the risk that we take is not like in countries like Syria or, you know, very, very fragile contexts. But we we do have a, uh, we do actually support the State Fragility Council with a grant. And um, so and the reason for that was because we wanted to explore. So if we don't have a an answer to a question we you know we want to support academia and you know others who are researching that and, and at a very basic level distributed re renewable energy is so flexible um, that it can potentially be extremely useful in fragile contexts where it's you're never going to build a top-down kind of power system and so just at the very basic level you know that we do see a potential fit there and so for example even in the middle of the Syrian crisis they were somehow second-hand solar panels were finding their way from Germany to Syria they were like there was no diesel to be found anywhere, and so solar panels were like powering, um, you know, agricultural production and irrigation systems. They were powering local enterprises, local shops, local coffee kind of cafes and, and stuff like that in Syria. And so that just really struck me as a, as a kind of an amazing kind of example of human ingenuity like how the hell were those secondhand panels getting into syria from germany like nobody even knew it was just like just this incredible secondary market and it, and, it, and the other area is um in refugee centers where you know there is um a huge often a huge lack of any kind of services very hard again to build those services especially in temporary um places and so temporary settings and so you know solar pv systems again um are being used in those contexts um but again i think something that we we need to explore but we definitely don't do enough of that kind of work at the moment yeah so i was i was going to mention some of the same things that um in humanitarian settings 
the private sector is active. I mean, people are running small businesses. Um, they're selling. They're selling goods. They're, they're trying to. There are there are models that are testing uh, solar home system provision and other services in humanitarian settings. So I, I think the same model does work in those systems. Perhaps it's not done at the right scale, though, and more could be channeled into that. Um, a second point. I would make is that if you're going to to do these types of things in fragile settings, you might target then different emergencies, so to speak. So you might char target food security, for example, before energy access, and so there, there's, there's just a different timing and focus that you would you would um, use in terms of the resilience that you want to build and how you're going to build it. But it does work um, for those different topics, and it does it does happen with energy access in places like Somalia, for example. Um, these models have been working. So, thanks. I want to say very quickly, we also, we are working, I, I don't have an update, but we are working on uh, the Metro Grid uh, model in DRC, which is a fairly fragile setting, and, you know, it's, it's extremely difficult work in those settings, but that's probably the most challenging GAP, uh, Global Energy Alliance priority country, is DRC, um, but, yeah, nothing in Yemen or Syria or, you know, anywhere like that. Other questions? Anybody? Yes, please. Just one additional point on, on, on the risk. I mean, we, we've already said these are not vanilla investments, and the risk is significantly higher in those types of settings. And I think we need to um, have a conversation with the relevant players about the risk appetite, even of those making the grants, that comes into play as well. So it's not just about um, is, the, is the business more risky, but who, what's the risk appetite of even the grant-making entities? So that, that comes into play. So if we don't have any more questions from the audience, oh, Jorge. No, I'll, I'm gonna do mine in closing, so go ahead. Oh, your show and tell? Please. He has dance moves like you would not believe. <laughs> Woo, Jorge, por favor. Please, Jorge, Jorge, Jorge. Okay, uh, <laughs> okay, content, if you insist. We, one of the biggest problems that we had in the early days of carbon markets is uh, the scale. So you look into these projects that were fantastic, you actually could have that technology to measure the amount of reductions that could be done and the avoided emissions. But uh, uh, what was lacking was what we used to call in that, in that space the bundlers or the aggregators. So actors, local actors that knew the, 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 the space and that could identify different thousands of little projects that they could aggregate and then as a, as a package could be presented into our current markets. So the transactional costs went down immediately, but what we discovered, I was involved in that process 20 years ago, uh, is that there was a lack of, of those bundlers and aggregators in these countries. Have you seen something, anything different after 20 years of current markets being in, in existence? So first of all, you've been very kind to carbon markets there. That was only one of the problems. There was a lot of problems with integrity. There was a lot of problems with, you know, you know, cash for hot air, for, you know, you know, super critical coal plants, replacing coal plants. And there was a lot of problems with the CDM. And I, I don't think, but I think we can learn from those problems. But this aggregation issue is a huge issue, especially when it comes to small, small projects like mini grids. And, you know, all I would say is that I've been trying <laughs> To, to convince the Global Energy Alliance to actually perform that aggregation role in the markets that it's playing in, because I think it could provide a sort of a, a boilerplate service to all of these small developers and could provide that aggregation function, uh, because you know the, the amount of credits that would be generated by any one project would probably not actually uh, justify the transaction costs of certifying those credits. So, you know, I think it's still an issue for small projects, absolutely, and, uh, you know, not just for energy projects, but nature-based projects as well. Um, and especially in Africa, it's an issue across the continent. There is an initiative that, you know, we have been involved in it that was launched at COP27, which was the Africa Carbon Markets Initiative, which is looking at that among other, other challenges.
I'm going to put the music on in just a minute. Yeah. You got the music ready? Jorge, will you just tell him the song? What's the song, Jorge? <laughs> so, uh, I picked one already, so you don't need to pick one. So here's the question. It's kind of serious. We'll dance later. At some point, the system cracks. The financial system, we cannot continue the way that we are. I mean, we're, we're talking about these projects, and we're looking for returns of a certain thing. But meanwhile, those returns don't reflect the externalities the, that should be internal. So the price of the doing the business we're doing, whether that's extraction or whatever that is, burning fossil fuels and other things, damaging people and planet, it's when will it crack? What is where is it start with workforce? Does it start with supply chain? We've already seen immense and expensive billions and billions of dollars of the cracks. So when does the global financial architecture bend? And I know that's not what we came to talk about, but it seems like the elephant in the room that we're talking to investors ourselves and they're saying, well, you know, our um, investment committee will look at everything and it needs to meet this criteria and we're making the business case for adaptation and resilience. And I, I, th I think there's, there's something that we're not talking about and that is that the return that was made in the first place, which is to extract the thing and burn the, the earth and hurt the people and the kids and the women and the local communities, and then you want the same return on the backside to fix it. And that doesn't quite add up. So you don't have to answer this question, <laughs> but I think we're coming to a fork in the road where the, what we have doesn't work anymore. And I think we're seeing lots of signs of it. But um, does anyone want to come on that? I won't, it's not in your prepared notes, so you are not required to say that. So thank you, Joe. Yeah, I mean, when will it crack? I mean, it's kind of, it's cracking. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, it just seems like we're, we, we are kind of moving from crisis to crisis and it's putting incredible pressure on the financial system. I mean, have we recovered from the 2007, 2008 financial crisis? I mean, you know, uh, there, <laughs> I don't want to get political, but, you know, there's certain political developments in Europe, in North America, which would suggest that we, we haven't really recovered from that yet. And then you have COVID, and then you have, you know, what we're probably going to be entering into, into over the next, you know, supply chain issues and all of that kind of stuff. But I mean, I feel like we get a lot, like, we come to these conferences and we hear a lot from, you know, the, the, the sort of Morgan Stanleys and the, you know, the big corporate investors. And, you know, we hear about GFANS and 130 trillion under management. But, you know, then we just keep on, you know, financing what we've always been financing. And, you know, there's a lot of inertia built into the system. And, um, you know, it's very hard. I, I, I certainly don't have the solutions, but I definitely think it's, it's beginning to crack and we're beginning to just come up against these limits, these inherent limits. And I don't know how long we can, you know, do, keep on along this path. <laughs> um, I believe we are operating in a learning system a learning system. We see changes. The question is if we are quick enough and the, the question is if anybody has the solutions already at hand. I think really we are in a learning system. And um, I sometimes, let's, I can all again provide from many dialogues with corporates which I have around the world at the moment, the feedback that's actually also pretty overwhelming. It's not that they don't don't want to change, but there's a lot of regulation out there. Um, even institutions who have dedicated teams and can can maintain dedicated teams find it hard to keep up with regulation, which they are tested and audited against. So they don't have the flexibility of piloting at something they don't feel co completely comfortable with. Um, so there are, there are liability risks attached to that as well. And if you look into the smaller corporates, they, they can't afford 20 people looking after sustainability. There is the CFO who does the accounting and also sustainability. So they need also some help in the competences and the capacities to implement standards and understand how their system is impacting environment and how environment is impacting their system. So. 
Uh, sure, I'll, um, I don't have the answer either, um, unfortunately. But I will say that uh, I think as this, <laughs> yeah, I'm disappointed too. <laughs> as, the, as the system starts to crack, it's cracking at the top, really. And I think the solution then maybe lies at the bottom in terms of building up um, instead of one centralized system where, it, yeah, we're, we're the top. If the top falters, everything below it falters, the solution is maybe to build up the bottom so that there's more resilience across different nodes. So um, hopefully what we're all doing in our, in our daily jobs and what we're doing here at COP can lead to that a bit more. I hope so too. There are lots of, lots of opportunities, lots of promise. So I think the best way to close this panel, we heard a lot of um, important, important things, but um, I don't think I need to summarize. I think you all heard it. I hear urgency. I hear a clear message on we can't keep going with coal. Um, without tipping into something that is unlivable for us. Um, we didn't really even get to talk about insurance, which is the risk piece of this. Um, so I think we should close with a song. And so I'm not going to sing it. No, no, no. I don't mean that. No, no, no. I'm just going to play a song, and we're past time. So dance if you like. No obligation. Jorge, it's up to you. But let me play our song. Oh, I was going to. by Pharrell Williams. Let's bring it back up. Yes, we have to keep our optimism, a little bit of levity, a little bit of humor to get us through. So thank you everyone for joining us. You're in the Resilience Hub at COP27 and have a great rest of your day. Look forward to seeing you at the next event. Thank you very much.